What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? Don't ever wait for your doctor to order blood tests. With Private MD Labs, you can get your blood test prescription online in under one minute and go directly to over 4,000 lab locations in the United States. They offer every blood test imaginable at affordable prices with highly accurate results from tried and true state-of-the-art blood testing diagnostics. In fact, I've been using Private MD Labs for more than a decade. Their blood tests are much more in-depth and accurate than any at-home pinprick or worthless saliva test. Skip the intrusive doctor questions and get the exact tests that I recommend. Be proactive and get your panels today. Go to privatemdlabs.com forward slash JC to take 15% off your order. Send you guys love and light. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be around the world. I am Jay Campbell, and of course, you are watching the Jay Campbell Podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual uh, stream yard, not Zoom, studio with a longtime great friend of mine, Dr. Keith Nichols. Dr. Keith Nichols, what is up, my brother? Hey, man, it's great to see you again, Jay. Great to see you again. It is great to see you again. Just haven't been, hadn't been on video with each other in quite some time, but we do talk frequently, so that's awesome. Yeah, well, well, so I will uh, let the cat out of the bag for when this video runs, which will probably be sometime in the middle of the end of June. Uh, Keith and I are working on a book together, which is going to be absolutely positively the be-all, end-all book on hormone optimization, not just for bros and men, but for women. And uh, his wife, Angie, is you know easily one of the finest I would say treatment professionals, subject matter experts and working with women in the field. Keith and her have been optimizing women for more than a decade now. They've seen it all. They've been, they've dealt with it all. And I can just tell all of you guys that are watching this podcast right now. And of course the whole, you know, Jay Campbell audience and the whole tier one, you know, community that we're putting a lot of energy and effort into this book and it's going to be unbelievable. Okay. So that said, uh, Keith and I are going to talk about some really important topics today. But before we say we jump in, Keith, because you know, today's May 18th, uh, 2022. And again, this podcast will probably run within the next 30 to 40 days. Um, just your big picture thoughts on, you know, where this is going. I mean, clearly shit has, you know, unraveled in the last two and a half years with COVID and the, and the allopathic community. I mean, you could tell me stories. I mean, you and I talk all the time about how ridiculous things are with compounding pharmacies and just the FDA yeah. and all the other yeah. nonsense. But like, what do you think is going to happen ultimately in the, say the next three to five years with just the entire optimization space? Well, what I, what I worry about is uh, something that we and I, you and I discussed years ago. It was my worry then it becomes my worry. Now, as you know, you know, testosterone clinics are opening up on, on every corner. You, uh, you right. actually, you can't get on any social media without a new testosterone therapy clinic opening up. And my fear, is that ultimately the you know the fda will come in and they will restrict testosterone's use just like they did growth hormone my fear has always been that the way they will restrict this use will simply be to come in and say you cannot any longer use testosterone off-label to treat symptoms that right. you can only you can only treat men that have true hypogonadism as defined by the endocrine society or whatever society they may uh, choose which would be Basically, a man that tests two times less than 264, you know, two morning fasted tests right. less than 264. In other words, meets the strict criteria for hypogonadism before we can initiate treatment. And, and in all honesty, it takes a very sick man to meet right. those criteria. It means it takes a very right. sick man. And uh, and so that, that's that's always been my fears that that's ultimately what's going to happen. Uh, I do think that uh, with this exponential growth and uh, i'm going to call a lot of them t-mills uh yeah. now providing anabolic steroids and other things on top of of, uh, of uh, testosterone I, I think that uh we're going to see some legislation come through just like we did with the pill mills for pain management right 
That, right. that is that is that is my greatest fear. So I mean, you might be right. I mean, obviously, you know, to add on to that, we both know that there's been massive regulation of compounding pharmacies. You know, they're looking at them now also because a lot of those guys are essentially it's the wild wild west, Keith. You know, they're prescribing peptides that are obviously not FDA approved. They're not approved in a lot of the ways that people are using them. And I don't want to rabbit hole on that, but I'm, I'm kind of with you. You know, I'm also though, you know, glass half full. And I, you know, I like to think or say that, you know, the truth and, you know, the best part of life always seems to find a way. So even if what you say, you know, does, you know, eventually come, I feel like there's enough of us out there in the trenches fighting the good fight, uh, you know, that will, push us through, but you're right. I mean, it, there's a lot of landmines to maneuver. So, so, so today for all of you guys, um, you know, again, who are familiar with Keith and I know a lot of my audience is, you know, Keith and I go way back, you know, we've lectured together, you know, he was one of the founding doctors on the TOT revolution podcast shit, dude, going back to 2016, yeah. uh, you know, six years ago. Um, and you know, that podcast may eventually reboot, you know, with, uh, with Keith and some other guys, but, uh, you know, for now, Keith and I talk all the time, of course, you know, he's one of my recommended doctors, uh, you know, through my course and through my private groups and stuff like that. And, you know, he wanted to make this podcast, you know, to center, I would, I would say, or centralize a lot of the thoughts that he and I have had, you know, over the last five or six years. And, you know, to Keith's credit, and I've never told anybody this, I don't think publicly, but, you know, Keith, when I didn't know him, when he read the TOT Bible back in like two, I, I want to say actually it was the TRT manual that you first read. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he started messaging me on two, in 2015 and 2016, like right after it was published. And he was like, you know, Jay Campbell, you don't know me. Your, your book is amazing, but here's where you're a mess. You know, here's where you're wrong. And I, and I, I would see his emails and I'd be like, this guy is so smart, you know? And then as he knows, I would message him like, dude, when you come on a podcast and be like, ah, oh, not anytime soon. Right. But he would, he would, he would coach me and mentor me and educate me on where I was wrong. And eventually I, you know, through the process of being Jay Campbell and you know, attrition, I, I got him to break down and he finally came on the podcast. And then he, again, he became the big guy on the round table. And, you know, now he's got this world-class practice, which is tier one HW, which is tier one health and wellness.com. For all of you guys watching him and his wife are the best there is in the whole business. I, I don't use those words lightly. It's true. Um, but today's podcast is to really go through what him and I think are the central points of doing this correctly. And as you know, Keith will tell you guys on the podcast today with all the, t the, the windmill clinics, the T mills, the anabolic steroid prescribing, you know, you know, docs now out there. Cause like you, you know, Keith, they're everywhere. They're almost That's on right. every corner in every major city. Uh, we really want to dispel the bullshit, get rid of the nonsense and put everything in one, you know, podcast It's probably going to be a little bit more than an hour long here today, but really let people watch this, especially in the prescribing community so that they can stop making mistakes because, you know, as Keith will tell you, and, you know, Keith obviously learns from Dr. Neil Rougier. We've all learned from Dr. Neil Rougier at World Link Medical, who's by far the best testosterone optimization teaching doc on the planet. Uh, there's a way to do this correctly. This is not, you know, we're not guessing anymore. You've been prescribing, you know, with doctors for 10 years, you know, your story is very clear. You did all the different delivery systems yourself. You had no idea when you went through all the nonsensical stuff previously. So you've learned, you know, through trial and error. And now you've been doing it with all these men and women across the planet, you know, and obviously I would say very successfully. So again, today's podcast is for all of you guys and women out there, especially women, um, you know, who want to understand how to do this right. So Keith, let me just throw up here real quick. First topic, and this is an important topic, and that's just right. the difference between what you and I do and talk about versus what people think it is, which is testosterone optimization versus testosterone replacement therapy. So the floor is yours, my friend. You got it. Well, I mean, there seems to be some confusion on the difference between testosterone therapy and hormone optimization. Testosterone therapy is just that. It's the utilization of just testosterone. Now that is adequate for a younger man in his teens or 20s if they're suffering from hypogonadism, maybe a man even in his early 30s. But as we get into our 40s and above, it really becomes more about hormone optimization and not just testosterone therapy. Right. People need to understand what is hormone optimization. It's simply understanding this, that each hormone has beneficial effects. And the goals of hormone optimization are to simply 
maximize the beneficial effects of each hormone by optimizing levels of each hormone. Right. The better the levels, the better the effects. There is a dose response uh, relationship, just like with testosterone. So that's really what hormone optimization is about. It's about prevention. It's about preventing age-related disease, disability, right. dependence, and, and frailty. It's about preserving the health span. We want to age healthy and strong. That's, that's really what it's all about. Uh, the misperception out there is that it's all about just testosterone. So it's just really about guys that want it for performance enhancement, muscles, or, or sex. Well, that's, that's not what hormone optimization is about. We're just as concerned about the prevention of cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, diabetes, cancer, as we are any of those others. So that's really the, the, where the confusion fusion comes in, is there is a lot of misuse out there. We know that with a younger crowd. But what we want to focus on and what my practice focuses on is middle aged men and women that simply want a better quality of life. Right. They work hard. They have children, maybe even grandchildren, and they just want to enjoy being with their family. They're not focused on taking selfies with their shirts <laughs> off at the gym. They, they are literally they just want to live a better quality of life. Okay. I mean, they're not in the bro science forums, dude, debating you. That's right. And so, so that's that's really the the, the patient that, that 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 I that I aim to serve it are those people that just want to to work hard and be with their family and their friends and and their children and just to have a quality of life that is better than 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 you know not of course uh, doing hormones and I've always said that there is a what I call a trifecta of health that there's a, there are the three pillars of health and it is of course nutrition. It is, of course, exercise, and it is, of course, hormone optimization, especially 40 right. and above. Now, people right. will say, well, you've got to have sleep and you've got right. to have stress. Well, of course you do, but you are not always in control of those two. Exactly. You're not in control, but your schedule may not, will dictate whether you get enough sleep or, right. you know, if you're under a lot of stress, but Probably. you're 100% right. in control of what you eat, whether you get up and exercise or not, and whether or not you do hormone optimization. So those are the, that's the trifecta of health as I see it. And so, so that's. Oh, well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you, I, I want to ask you, I want to go deeper. Um, you and I talked about this yesterday or the day before when we were doing the book. And I want you to comment on testosterone uh, uh, booster bullshit, right? Because as you and I know, and you know, you just said it best, the, the, the three pillars are nutrition, obviously hormone optimization and exercise right? right so you can control those three things but again a lot of men keith and you know this i mean this you see this every day in your clinical practice and have for more than a decade they come to you and they're like you know i've been using so and so's testosterone booster or i've been you know using tom cat ali i mean i could go on and on and on I, you know i want you to really clarify for people you know that again you you know I, i'm not coaching you on the answer you know the answers yourself but you and I have talked about this at length. We've researched it. There is no scientific efficacy at all other than the placebo effect for any of these products. But yet people, Keith, still throw their money away when they watch Frank Thomas and Doug Flutie and all these other guys that run these freaking commercials that are on NFL and college sports all the time, you know, mm -hmm. eugenics. I mean, I don't have to name anything else, but I mean, it's insane. Why does it proliferate and continue to brainwash men? The fitness industry preys. The fitness industry preys on desperate people that want a quick fix. They're desperate for, for help and a need, but you know, a lot are, are, are truly, uh, you know, suckered into it but a lot are truly just looking for a shortcut they and a are. quick fix that that does not exist and and, and that none of them work they don't work you know the sad, <laughs> the sad truth of the matter is not only do they not work quite frankly a lot of the pharmaceutical drugs right. are in such a yes. low dose they don't work yes, well. dude. so you think you're going to take a supplement that's going to raise testosterone enough to work well well we can show you some pharmaceutical subs uh grade products that only raise your levels a little bit that's how they're designed to raise it to a certain level, like exactly. maybe 400 plus or minus 100 nanograms per deciliter, that raises it a little bit. And, you know, I can show you literally dozens of studies where testosterone doesn't work in men. It didn't right. work whatever they were using it for. Okay, depression, right. sexual function, you name it. And there is a common denominator of why it didn't work in each of those studies. It's because they only raise testosterone a little bit. If you right. only give a little bit, then you're not going to get 
really any results. So those uh, studies were essentially designed to fail. Uh, it's no different than if you designed a study with an antibiotic, but you only gave a fraction of the antibiotic that was really needed to treat the infection. You could prove that that antibiotic doesn't work. Well, right. that's what happened with testosterone in a lot of studies is they just didn't use enough to exert a response. And, and that's and, and that's that's a sad uh, case. But nonetheless, these supplements out there do not work to raise your testosterone levels to a sufficient enough degree right. to degree to provide you with any significant health benefits. Let's just leave it at that. We needed to define, raise it enough to provide you with significant health benefits. And that, and that's important. That's an important concept. And I, you know, I would obviously a hundred percent agreement. I would also add, and you know, this, you can't trust supplement label claims either. There's no regulation. There's no sterility control or process. These guys can say whatever they want. And, and, and you and I, and you've dealt with patients, I have guys all the time who message me and they're like, look, I've never been on testosterone. You know, I'm afraid, you know, we're going to talk about that at some point in the podcast, you know, the demonization in the media of it, you know, it's wrong. It's unethical. It's immoral. It's cheating, whatever. But they take the boosters and their freaking hair falls out or yeah. they get acne right. or they, their erection issues become even more pronounced. I mean, again, and, 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 you know, we don't, I don't want a rabbit hole, but you don't know what you're buying. It could just, be anything. Like you said, it could correct. be a low dose pro hormone that inhibits you more. Yes. Supplements in, in summary are not regulated by the FDA and there's no guarantee of purity or potency. The end. That, that's exactly what you just <laughs> said. Summarize it into one sentence. That, and that, so it's buyer beware, as we've talked about before. And buyer Keith, beware. You know this from your practice. I mean, again, I want to beat the head of this because it's cheaper to work with one of the top guys in the world and get prescribed than it is to buy these $200 a month bullshit supplements and do nothing. It is. It is. It is. It's, it is. <laughs> I mean, it's it's insane it's that they would is. rather buy Frank Thomas's pills than work with a legitimate hormone optimization doctor who is going to give them the real thing. And as you said, raise them to a level that provides benefit. Correct. That's the key. Raising it to a level that will provide benefit. That is correct. Unbelievable. Okay. So let's switch to uh, the three. One more thing. One more thing before we get into our myths, just because Please. I want to make sure that we say it on the podcast. I've been wanting to say it for years when it comes to hormone optimization. Here's how it is viewed on, let's just say on the internet or forums is that men tend to look for hormones or taking a substance only if it has feel good effects. Right. We need to understand that a couple of hormones have a lot of feel good effects. That would be testosterone and thyroid. But most of the other hormones don't have feel good effects. They have beneficial effects. OK, vitamin D, for instance, we know we need it for bone health. You, nobody needs to, to teach you that. Everybody knows you need it and you don't feel it when you take it. You don't know right. if you take it or not. Same will go for maybe DHEA and some of the others. But nonetheless, there are beneficial effects of hormones and then there are feel good effects. Right. So you'll hear these guys say all the time. Just take testosterone in isolation. Right. And if you feel better, you don't need anything else, especially if your levels are normal. Okay, let's break that down. Yep. 90% of men that start testosterone start, start testosterone with what? Normal levels. Right. Okay. But yet they still start at testosterone. Right. Then they'll say, well, don't do anything else, especially if you have normal levels. But yet they start at testosterone with normal levels. That's because they're all in in testosterone. Right. The problem is, is that testosterone is a feel good hormone. All right. You can give enough men testosterone. They will feel better. Right. But they don't get the beneficial effects of the other hormones unless you also optimize those levels. And they don't have a lot of feel good effects. Hormone optimization is applying the same rationale that those guys use for testosterone to every hormone. Right. Right. That's how you do it. If you do that, you have the battle won. So you optimize them all to gain the beneficial effects of every one of them because most don't have feel good effects, but younger guys especially are only caught up into the feel good effects. Right. They won't take something if they can't tell if they take it or not, even if it provides them with significant beneficial effects as you know, like cancer prevention, for instance, everybody right. wants cancer prevention. You ask anybody, do you want cancer prevention? Yeah, doc, I want a lot of that. Well, you better take this hormone because it will provide you with some cancer protection but you're not going to feel it when you take it. Oh, okay. Well, then, then it kind of makes sense to them. But nonetheless, just understand there are feel good effects and beneficial effects. 
And most of the other hormones don't have a lot of feel good effects. They're mainly beneficial effects. Okay. Hey guys, what's going on? If you're looking to level up your life from a mind, body, and spiritual perspective, join the fully optimized health private membership group today. There is no better place online to discuss hormones, peptides, fitness, fat loss, supplements, and even raising your consciousness with an elite tribe of men and women. You also get to speak to me directly every single week in the Ask Me Anything. Join today. Go to fullyoptimizedhealth.com and sign up and I'll see and talk to you soon. Let me add, because it's good stuff. The, the truth is, is that, you know, and I learned this from you and, you know, other guys, hormones are a symphony. You can't like, you know, optimize one group the endocrine system without also optimizing the thyroid and you can't optimize the thyroid if you're not actually controlling for insulin. So all of those things you just said, it's again, it takes a uh, experiential body practice doctor who's been working with a large, you know, body of patients, men and women who's gone through the ringer and seen what happens, you know, with things by themselves, which is not right versus, you know, looking at all of the hormonal pathways, Right. systems and cascades and then optimizing all of them. So you're totally right. It's, it's just saying it like this. Hormones have beneficial effects, but they work synergistically. Right. Bottom line. Okay. hundred yeah, percent. Okay. So here we go. So back to the three big testosterone myths, we're going to drill down on all of these. Uh, but Keith, let me just say, you know, obviously the biggest issue that I had and you still have to this day when I was writing the book, you know, was, how do you cover these myths? Because they're so promulgated in the world, you know, the disinformation, the misinformation, the, the myths, uh, the demonization, right? right? It's so difficult to overcome. So I remember that was the hardest part of writing the book is like, you know, how do I get Abraham Morgan Taylor's information about the prostate and heart benefits and, you know, testosterone is cardioprotective. So, you know, this, obviously this podcast is, for three specific ones that, you know, keep deals with every day. And obviously I've been doing it for a long time too, but uh, this is important stuff. And, and, and that's again, why we're doing this podcast so that we can put this out here and people can watch this. And as you know, Keith, there will be a lot of young and up and coming clinicians who do want to learn how to do this correct right. way. So again, that's, that's kind of where we're going with this, but go ahead. It's up the floor is yours. Well, these won't be the last time you hear me talk about these myths. You'll see it in other podcasts. You're going to see right. me in some review articles that I'm writing on, on, on several of these topics. So, so a lot coming out in the very near future, but I do think it's very important that we do address the three big testosterone therapy myths as I see it, uh, as far as a clinical practice goes. Now we can all think Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler, when it comes to the first big testosterone myth was, is with regard to testosterone and prostate cancer. Now this is the story of Dr. Huggins, Dr. Morgenthaler, and the saturation model. All right. So Abraham Morgenthaler, uh, your Harvard urologist, is the one that really, really, we can all thank for allowing us to take testosterone as men. Because here's what has been thought for over seven decades. It has been that high testosterone causes prostate cancer or increases a man's risk of getting prostate cancer. Right. It was also thought that low testosterone was protective against prostate cancer and that if you raise testosterone level, you would cause an existing prostate cancer to grow rapidly, the equivalent of pouring gasoline on a fire. We've all heard right. that, right? right. <clears throat> now, where did this originate? Where did this, uh, this thought process originate? Well, it came from a paper written in 1941 by two urologists, doctors Huggins and Hodges. Now, Dr. Right. Huggins was an extremely famous urologist. He went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1966 for his work with hormones and cancer. So when this guy put out something, you know, people paid attention. Right. So in this paper in 1941, they looked at men with metastatic prostate cancer. Now, back then there wasn't a PSA test. So they looked at a serum marker called prostate acid phosphatase to follow men with metastatic prostate cancer. Now, in this study, Dr. Huggins reported that when men were castrated, either surgically or chemically, that the acid phosphatase levels would go down. Right. He also gave testosterone injections to men, and he reported that in every man he gave testosterone injections to, that the acid phosphatase levels went up. Now, that sounds really bad, okay? So when he gave testosterone injections, that acid phosphatase level went up, all right? Now, 
At this time, this paper was extremely important because it established acid phosphatase as a serum marker for metastatic prostate cancer. It showed that castration was an effective method for treating metastatic prostate cancer and that testosterone injections given to men with metastatic prostate cancer was dangerous. All right, so that's where that's where this knowledge came from. Testosterone given to men with metastatic prostate cancer was dangerous. Now, Dr. Morgenthaler took a closer look at that paper. And when he did, what you see is that testosterone injections were only given to three men. Results were only given for two of those men. And one of those men had been surgically castrated. So he was no longer hormonally intact. So the general conclusion, and this is exactly what the paper says, that cancer of the prostate is activated by testosterone injections was based on one hormonally intact patient who received testosterone injections for only 18 days and whose acid phosphatase levels were erratic. They went up and down and were basically uninterpretable. Right. So what does all that say? That What I am saying is that decades of depriving men of testosterone was based on the overinterpretation of the results of one single man in one single study. All right. You probably think, well, well, how, how in the world can that happen? Well, the problem was back in the 1940s and 40s and 50s, there were not a lot of physicians that had any experience using testosterone. So no one had an adequate enough knowledge to question the results. So the results became dogma that testosterone was dangerous for prostate cancer. It's what I learned. It's what Dr. Morgenthaler learned. It's what every doctor has learned before me and what some are still learning to this day. So it wasn't until the 1990s that Dr. Morgenthaler began to question the validity of the androgen hypothesis. So in 1988, he actually began treating men with sexual dysfunction with low testosterone levels with testosterone. Now, there wasn't any Cialis or Viagra at that time. So, you know, your treatment options are pretty limited. So what he did notice, though, that in the men that he did give testosterone levels, testosterone to and raise their testosterone levels, that not only did they improve sexually, but they improved men mentally and physically. So, I mean, he was on to something there. I mean, these men were getting better as part of his practice, but what he was doing actually defied standard medical practice because in the 1980s, testosterone therapy was really only limited to a couple of men that were either had congenital or genetic disorders like Kleinfelders, they had pituitary disorders, or they right. had absent testes, all right? So he actually became concerned himself and cause some of his colleagues actually warned him, hey, what you're doing may be potentially dangerous based on the work of Huggins. So because of that fear in 1992, he actually began performing biopsies prior to giving men testosterone therapy, okay? Now these men did have hypogonadism, they were testosterone deficient, but they had normal PSAs and a normal digital rectal exam. So these men, you know, normal PSA, normal digital rectal exam, they just had low testosterone levels. So before he gave them testosterone, he would do a biopsy. And what he found was that in the 11 out of the first 77 men that he biopsied had prostate cancer. Now, remember, low testosterone was supposed to be protective against prostate cancer. But what he found was that about 14 percent of men with low testosterone levels actually had prostate cancer. And this percentage of men was about the same percentage of men that have prostate cancer that have an elevated PSA and a positive digital rectal exam. So at this time, we discovered that he discovered that low testosterone was not protective for prostate cancer. And he published right. those findings in the Journal of the Medical Medi Journal uh, in JAMA in 1996. Oh, and so, by the way, just let me, hold on. Let me just say, you know, again, for the people that need to understand this better, this was like tantamount to completely overturning the entire world's mindset that, like you said, Elevated testosterone literally was the cause of some form of prostatic metastatic cancer, correct? Right. I mean, can we just not think about how brave this man actually was right. and is to right. this day? How, right. how if it wasn't for him, we would still be depriving men of testosterone to this day. Okay. That's unbelievable. So, you know, so he knew now that low testosterone was not protective, not protective at all. So, right. but what about high testosterone? Could it still be harmful? So in order to figure that out, he started doing some research. He was writing a paper that he was going to publish called Risk of Testosterone Replacement Therapy and Recommendations for Monitoring. And it was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2004. Now for that paper, 
he performed a review of the world literature from 1985 to 2004. So basically 20 years of research. And he was looking for any worrisome relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer or testosterone therapy and prostate cancer. In 20 years of studies, he was unable to find one single article that testosterone increased a man's risk of getting prostate cancer or that prostate or that testosterone therapy caused prostate cancer or prostate cancer progression. Amazing. Not one single study. All right. Now, he also made the observation that there was a tenfold increase in testosterone prescriptions at the time because around 2001 is when Androgel come out, came out. And so what he did see was that, hey, there is not an epidemic of prostate cancer despite all these men now using testosterone. We also know that 50% of men aged 50 years of, or older do have micro foci of prostate cancer in their prostate. So if increasing levels of androgens cause cancer to grow more rapidly, then we should see a lot more cancer growth in these men, and we don't. And Jay, the observation has also been right in front of us for decades. Yeah. That younger men with high testosterone levels don't get prostate cancer. Of course. Instead, it's a disease of aging when prostate cancers decline. Right. All right. So there's still a lot of confusion out there, and I'm going to explain that for you right now because it's still is not going to make a lot of sense to people, but I want to make sure they understand it today. And that is about the saturation model. Right. So in 2007, Dr. Morgan Tyler developed the saturation model to make sense of two opposite observations that data reported, that castration decreases testosterone and the PSA will go down. And if you increase testosterone levels out of the castrate range, the PSA also increases. So what are we saying? You cut off a man's testosterone, PSA will go down. You give him testosterone, it goes up. Now, the castrate range is defined as 50 nanograms per deciliter or less. So low testosterone level, okay? All right. But what the data also shows is that for most of the range of testosterone, including super physiologic levels, there is no change in PSA level or prostate size. Why is that? Because androgens like testosterone have a limited ability to stimulate prostate tissue. In order right. for androgens to exert an effect, they have to bind to the androgen receptor. And once those androgen receptors are fully saturated with androgen, any increase is just simply excess androgen. It can have no effect on prostate tins, uh, tissue growth. So the saturation of the androgen receptors occurs at a very low level, which is around 250 nanograms per deciliter. Above this level, androgens have no further effect on benign or cancerous prostate tissue growth. So let me summarize that saturation model. Less than 250, less than 50 nanograms per deciliter, you will suppress prostate cancer growth. If you give testosterone level to a man that is in castrate range, it will cause prostate cancer growth up to a level of 250 nanograms per deciliter or about that. If you keep raising testosterone levels above that, it will have no effect on prostate cancer growth whatsoever. Okay. So as Dr. Morgan Tyler will tell you, think of the prostate like a house plant. If you deprive the plant of water, it shrinks. If you give it water at that point, it's going to grow, but you can give it all the water you've got and it will have no further effect on growth. It'll never grow into a tree. He'll say, so you can give it a constant water supply and it just won't keep growing because once it's thirst has been quenched, Giving it any additional water will have no effect on growth. And the same goes for testosterone in the prostate. So what does the modern data show us? In hypogonadal men, men with low testosterone levels, testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of developing prostate cancer, even in high-risk individuals. It may, in fact, have a protective role against high-grade cancer. And studies show that higher levels of testosterone can suppress prostate cancer growth. Right. Let me explain that. Jay, there is an inverted U with regard to prostate cancer cell proliferation and testosterone levels. So an inverted U, it goes like this. OK, at low testosterone levels, there is suppression of prostate cancer cell proliferation. So at right. castrate levels, prostate cancer doesn't want to grow. All yep. right. Got that. OK, between castrate levels and the saturation level. Hypogonadal men, there is growth. Right. And with high levels of testosterone, there's again suppression Drop. of prostate cancer growth. Right. Okay. Are we following along there? Yep. 
All right. The unfortunate reality is that one in six men have prostate cancer. And let's think about all these clinics that are out there. If they have 60 patients or more, they have at least 10 men with active prostate cancer right now that they are treating and they don't know it. So these clinics are in effect treating men on active surveillance and it's not causing any detrimental effects. Why? Because if you give a man with active prostate cancer testosterone who has a level above 250, it has no effect on prostate exactly. cancer growth. So therefore, testosterone therapy does not increase the risk of progression with men who in men who are on active surveillance. Testosterone therapy also doesn't increase the risk of biochemical recurrence after somebody's been treated for prostate cancer right. with radiation therapy or radical prostatectomy. In fact, studies have shown a decreased recurrence rate in men on testosterone therapy. Jay, I have quite a few men now that are on active surveillance and that have been treated for prostate cancer on testosterone and they're all doing wonderful. They have their right. lives back. Hey guys and gals, what's going on? If you're looking to use peptides, make sure you go to my number one source, Limitless Life Nootropics. For healing with BPC-157 and TB-500 or fat loss with ipamorelin, CGC-1295 and AOD-9604 to immunity with TA-1, thymus and alpha-1, Limitless has a huge selection. Go to LimitlessLifeNootropics.com and use my code J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I send you guys tremendous love and light. And you got to contrast them with guys who are on the deprivation model of Lupron who literally want to kill themselves. Yes, and we'll talk about, let's talk about that at the very end. So look, multiple studies reveal that it's low testosterone, not high testosterone, that is associated with higher grades of cancer, a more advanced stage of cancer surgery, an increased rate of recurrence after surgery, and decreased survival. It's not high testosterone levels or taking testosterone levels. It's the inverse. It's the inverse. Okay. And so where people get confused is we're talking about the treatment of men who have a high risk of prostate cancer or that are on active surveillance or that have already been treated for prostate cancer. We're talking about treating those men with testosterone therapy, and it's been shown to be safe and actually right. beneficial. But where the confusion lies is that you're talking about men that are being treated for metastatic prostate cancer. Right. Now, in those men, what they do is they will they will castrate those men. OK, that doesn't cure them of the disease <laughs> that is trying to prolong their life. What ultimately <laughs> happens those men is it becomes castrate resistant. And so it has, so it it just becomes, you know, it doesn't matter what the levels are. It becomes castrate resistant and the prostate cancer spreads even without testosterone or anything else. So what you are seeing is that those men now are actually being treated with testosterone and in high doses, it's called bipolar androgen therapy. So what you're seeing is this, this massive shift in what we used to think. Right. And now we're actually treating men with metastatic prostate cancer with the high, high dose super physiologic levels of testosterone. Right. And it, it is, it is, a, it is a good treatment. And, you know, and, and I think another thing is that whenever a man gets metastatic prostate cancer, we do chemically castrate them. And exactly what you just pointed out, those guys leave, lead a miserable existence. Not worth living. They are not worth living. So, there are many men now that are choosing a quality of life of over course. a quantity. Okay. Exactly. They would rather live a shorter period of time of course. with their sexual function intact, with their strength intact, not being depressed than they would wanting to die. It's horrible. dude. They're a shell of a man. It is a horrible existence. I feel sorry for every one of them. When I get prostate cancer, I will choose quality over quantity. Of course, that, dude, that was so well said. Um, so let me ask you, because this is the questions that are going to come in. Um, how does a guy who just listened to that, who is already in active management and has some quack doctor who denies him, right? Because we both know that's the normal situation even now, even when you're right. telling all that science. Right. What right. would you tell that man? Because there's going to be a lot of those guys. They're going to watch this. There's many of, thank goodness there's, 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 I just got back from the Androgen Society meeting where I was with the world's leading urologists all from around the country. And so there's plenty of, of, of those that will, will now actively treat those men. There are some that still want, that are still resistant to doing this, even though the yeah. medical literature shows that it's safe. So, 
So, you know, so what it has shown is that men that have been treated for prostate cancer, it is safe to treat them. Men that are on active surveillance with low-grade cancer, it's safe to treat them. I'll give you an example. Just had a patient recently, and uh, he was coming as a new patient. And, of course, part of that workup, we do their testosterone levels and everything else. We get their prostate-specific antigen. And, you know, he was, uh, you know, 70. And his PSA was elevated, and he had a low percent free. And his... Uh, you know, testosterone level was well above 250. It was, you know, 400 or so, but he was right. severely symptomatic and he yep. was okay to, to take testosterone. But what I did is he had a, an elevated PSA. So that needed a further workup. So initially he went to his family doctor and then to a urologist. His family doctor, you know, said that your PSA is elevated, repeated it. It was still elevated, went to the urologist, did a biopsy, had low grade prostate cancer, at least in three yeah. plus four. All right. Uh, and so the, the urologist wanted to do a radical prostatectomy on this. Of man. course. Okay? That's how they make money. So he called me up and he said, Doc, you know, uh, I, I don't want to stop my testosterone. I feel great, but my urologist wants to do a radical prostatectomy. What do you think? And I said, well, send me your pathology report. Let's take a look at it. So we did, and it was at least in three plus four, and it was just a, a small percentage too. Sure. And so I said, look, how about we do this? Let me set you up a consultation with Dr. Morgan. Hall. There you go. And he said, okay. So two weeks later, he had a consultation with Dr. Morgan Tyler, telemedicine, about a 30 minute consult. And you know what Dr. Morgan Tyler told him? He said, sir, do nothing. whatever you do, do not stop <laughs> your testosterone. <laughs> right. You do not need a radical prostatectomy. You just need to remain on active surveillance and get a prostate MRI like Dr. Nichols has recommended every right. year. We can follow your right. PSA, follow your MRI. And this guy called me back, the happiest guy in the world. A Couldn't lot. have been just, he's just, you know what? But what, what, what Morgan Tyler saved him from was guaranteed impotence. Sexual and, dysfunction. Yes. yes. And incontinence. So, you know, it's, you know, so, so, you know, <laughs> So, of course, he, he will most likely die with it, not from it. Right. And, and, and that, that, that's 80% that's of men, right? If you live to right. a certain age, 80%. Right. And, then, and then sadly, I've seen a man recently who had already had a radical prostatectomy oh. who only had a Gleason grade six, which is a low grade right. active surveillance type cancer, but he had already had a radical prostatectomy. Yeah, because he listened to him. You got to take it out. You got to cut it out. Well, here's what they'll tell you. And 90% of men will do this. When they hear the word cancer, whether it be low grade or not, they're so frightened. They want it out. They want it out. Get, me, and get it out of me. Yep. And that will end up doing a lot of those men more harm than leaving it there and just remaining under active surveillance. Keith, it's so right. That's beautiful, by the way. Um, it's mind blowing what the lab coat God can do to people when they use that C word. It's literally... It's like, that's how right. Monica's, I mean, you know the story. That's how Monica's mom died. She had a polyp that was just a polyp in her colon. And we got to cut it out. No, get it out of me. And, you know, the rest is history. Sepsis, three days later, life support, gone. Well, while, while we're speaking of that, uh, so, you know, so when men are listening about prostate cancer, look, yeah. whenever your, your doctor actually sit you down, you should always be given options, treatment Absolutely. options. It's important decision making so if you do yeah. if you are suspicious that there's an underlying prostate cancer there one route of treatment would be to go to your urologist who may follow your psa but ultimately will end up recommending that you undergo a random 12 core biopsy a blind biopsy use a rectal ultrasound they stick 12 needles in your prostate they right. you know and they have about a 40 percent miss rate you know so <laughs> you know, unfortunately you know you, you you're not going to catch them all or you also have a choice of simply undergoing a prostate MRI. Right. And if you see any suspicious lesion, just simply guide a needle, a single needle. If you see more right. than one lesion, of course, guide two needles. But the point right. is you'll just guide, MRI guided, prostate biopsy. Right. Okay. Right. Because there, there is a lot of, uh, you know, injury that can occur without 12 core biopsy. A lot of pain Absolutely. and suffering that does occur, but nonetheless, you realize the prostate is still really the only area of the body that we still blindly biopsy. If you see a lesion in the lung or the liver or wherever else, you're going to image guide a needle into that lesion. But the prostate, we still we still do that. And so it doesn't have to be done. So men out there, if you suspect you have an issue with your prostate, 
I recommend a prostate MRI, okay, multiparametric prostate of your MRI. If you see a lesion, then you can simply, you know, guide a needle into that lesion and biopsy it there. Okay, so uh, so so Keith, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break these up, you know, so that they're even better and more powerful. So for you guys watching right now, this is 43 minutes of absolute perfection. Part two is going to cover testosterone optimization and erythrocytosis and the many, many misunderstandings and myths and misnomers that come around uh, hemoglobin and hematocrit. So we'll cover that. And then depending on how long that takes, we may do a part three, which will be extremely important, maybe even more important than the other one, then that's testosterone optimization and managing estrogen and DHT, the truth. Remember, any of you guys can work with Dr. Keith and of course his lovely wife, Angie, by going to tier one hw.com. They can work with pretty much anywhere via telemedicine. Uh, but again, I highly recommend these guys. So we will be back with part two.